Assalamu alaikum everyone and welcome back to the channel. If you are new here, my name is Hannah. I am a trauma coach, biohacking coach, and content creator. I also practice medicine in the United States. And today's video is one that I've been working on for a very long time. It is going to be a very extensive what causes depression, the different types of depression, and how to tackle it. I think this is really going to be game changing for a lot of people because a lot of times when depression is being spoken about, it's almost being spoken about in a very distant manner. It's not spoken with a lot of nuance, it's not discussed with a lot of nuance, or always recognizing that there are so many different causes of depression. A lot of times it's just because people might be speaking about depression from their own experience, and so because their depression might have only one cause, they just assume that everyone else's experience with depression is the same. But that is not true. And in today's video, we're going to talk about seven different types of depression and how to specifically address each type. So if you're going through there and you're like, hey, this type is the kind that I'm dealing with, you're going to have your solutions. You're going to have your game plan of how to work on that. As a biohacking coach, I'm also going to throw in some tips and just talk about some neurophysiology and how that works. And I hope that you guys enjoy this video, inshallah. So let's start off with some basic terminology and information, right? Depression is a symptom. Depression is not a disease state. It's not a mental disorder. For depression to lead to a mental disorder, there are certain criteria that have to be met. And depressive disorders fall under the category of mood disorder. That's kind of in the realm of psychiatry. But for the sake of this video, I just want you guys to understand that depression is a symptom. And it is exactly what it sounds like. When you think of something that is depressed, it is pressed down. And one of the most common identifiable symptoms of depression is that you stop enjoying or feeling joy with things that used to bring you joy. You do not enjoy life like you used to. The things that used to make you happy no longer make you happy. And in addition to that, there can be other somatic symptoms. For example, somatic meaning body-based. So loss of appetite, you might be sleeping more or sleeping less. People might find that they have sleep disturbances. Your mood might be completely off, not just in terms of feeling more sad or more out of it, but some people actually have a type of depression that makes them more angry. You're more likely to ha outbur have outbursts or deal with rage, feelings of rage. So that is kind of what depression is. Now, if you are interested in kind of a more in-depth analysis of whether you have major depressive disorder, there is something called the PHQ-9, which is one of the assessments that we use as medical providers to assess to diagnose someone with major depressive disorder. Now take that with a grain of salt because just because you take note that, you know, you have something doesn't mean that it's always major depressive disorder, right? And that's why you go to a professional to get this diagnosed because it could be other things that are contributing to the symptoms. It's not cut and dry in that way. Now, one thing to know about depression, just as an experience, is most depression is self-resolving, meaning it's going to go away on its own, even if you didn't do anything for the majority of people. Within four to six weeks, most people will have overcome their depression, even to the extent that it was a depressive disorder. That's subhanAllah. Our brains are very resilient in that way, and that is experience of a huge majority of people. But that is not the experience of everyone. And even if you are in that timeline of four to six weeks is still a long time and it can be very overwhelming to be in that space and not know what to do. So that's not going to be, you know, with this video, you hopefully are not going to have to worry about that because you are going to have actionable items to actually implement in your day to day. That was what was super important for me going through my mental health journey. It is something I still turn to because guess what? I'm human too and my life is not perfect and things still bring me down and I still have episodes every now and then that I have to address. I'm much better at them now, alhamdulillah, and they've come far and few between, but that's because of a lot of the work that went into managing and building these game plans for myself. Another thing I will say before jumping into the actual types of depression is that there can be one or two types kind of intermingling and mixing together. And you are going to be the one who's able to identify that on your own. Because what I'm speaking about is going to be a lot of experience-based information. You're going to know, yes, this is my experience. This is what I deal with day to day. Or no, this doesn't really resonate with me. It's probably, yes, it might be legitimate, but it's just not my experience. That's completely okay. Just wait until you get to the part that is for you and let's jump right into it. So here are some different causes. I hope that you guys can see this. 
but we'll start off with cause number one. One of the major causes of depression for a lot of people is low self-esteem. And this is probably one of the more identifiable ones because we can see it in, in, in people from a very young age. Unfortunately, it's I guess fortunately and unfortunately, self-esteem is built very young. And it can be torn down by, especially by people who are close to you or people that you love. Because it is built very young, if it is built well, that becomes a very robust protector for people when it comes to just stress in life and the things that can contribute to mental illness and a lack of mental well-being. But because it is also built so young, there is a an opportunity to damage it completely. And when you are that young, you're not able to always fix what has been damaged because you just do not have the logical capacity for it. You're still a kid, your brain's not fully developed. So if you are an adult who's able to identify my depression is because of low self-esteem, not that the depression causes low self-esteem, but I had low self-esteem and it contributed to depression and led to depression. I don't think well of myself. I don't believe in myself. I don't believe that I have strengths or talents. I see myself as very little. I see myself as less than X, Y, Z. Maybe you're always comparing yourself to other people. If you feel like that is your major depressive kind of syndrome, like the set of symptoms that you have, then the way you deal with this, and I'm just looking at my notes in front of me if you see me looking down, is you really have to be extremely intentional about building a plan to build your confidence. There are lots of different ways that you can do this. I know it sounds super simple, right? It's like, okay, level low self-esteem, build a plan to build confidence. Okay, Hannah, if I had... If I had that plan, then I wouldn't have low self-esteem, right? And it's like, yes and no, right? Some people know what they need to do, but are too scared. Some people need guidance. So here's just my thoughts on this. If you're someone with low self-esteem, a few different things that you need to think about. Number one is if you can come to these ideas about yourself that are contributing to your low self-esteem, you first need to sit down and actually identify what those ideas are. We talked about a few of them in the beginning. Do you believe that you're not talented? Is it something about the way you look that is bothering you in, in, in contributing to your self-esteem? Is it that you have people who are really close around you who speak so lowly of you and so you've internalized that and now you believe it, right? Figure out what those things are. And then you go one by one and you say, is this thing true? Is this true? And if it's true, to what degree is it true on a scale of zero to 10? How true is it? Now, if something is true to a 10, well, we can, can we bring it down to a seven? Can we do things that are going to bring it down to a 6.5? If something is not true, then the question is, why do I believe it? Why am I internalizing it? If the evidence, the real stuff that is in front of me is not confirming this reason for my low self-esteem to be true, then why am I letting it affect me to that extent? So you need to first identify that, right? You you can't start somewhere if you don't know where to start. And number two is you need to do the things that make you more confident. Now, everyone, even the people with the lowest self-esteem still have something, one thing, two things that they know that they're really good at. So whatever that thing is for you, maybe it's uh, a certain sport you play, maybe it's public speaking, maybe you're just, you're really good in your relationships with people and your friendships with people. Those things that build your confidence, work on those and hone in on that skill to make it bulletproof. So first, like the reason that you're doing that is because that is a confidence building exercise in and of itself because you're able to prove to yourself, hey, I can actually do these things to be better. And here is one example. And then after you do that, now you've kind of built a bit of a tolerance for the discomfort because there's always going to be a little bit of discomfort in a learning curve when you're trying something new or trying to increase your skill set. And now you can kind of move to the things that maybe are a little, make you a little less confident. And you have to be willing to try and fail, try and fail. Another thing to consider in building self-esteem is can you find mentors or people that can help you? Sometimes that's just friends who really care about you, right? Sometimes it's literally identifying an expert. There are life coaches that do this, for example, who can help you see things from a different perspective and figure out how to play to your strengths in this situation. So there's that. Now, when I talk about self-esteem, I can't get around the fact that there are a lot of people who just have low self-esteem physically because of the way they look. And obviously some part of the way we look is not in our control because it's genetically determined, right? 
But at the same time, there is a lot that is in our control. And so if you're someone who deals with low self-esteem because of the way you look, why not build a plan to improve what you can improve genuinely that is going to make you feel more confident? So for example, a lot of people deal with struggles with weight. If one of your if one of your motivating factors in life is to improve the way you look and in doing that you would like to lose weight, then figure out what is the best way for you to do that in a way that is sustainable, safe, and healthy. And be proud of those little milestones that you meet, right? When you lose your first five pounds, when you lose the 10 pounds, right? When you notice that your pants are not fitting as tightly. Um, If you're someone who maybe just like weight is not your primary concern, but the way you look, okay, maybe it's time to get a new wardrobe. Maybe it's time to try a new haircut or if, you know, if you're... um, a woman watching this, a new hair color, right? Maybe it's time to uh, figure out what kind of accessories you like, right? These are things that might seem superficial, but Allah is beautiful and loves beauty and we do have the license to be able to figure out our style. This was actually one of the most fun parts for me just kind of growing up because I used to wear a lot of my sister's clothes. Um, And as I got older, I had to identify what my style is. Now, if you kind of take a note of my style, you'll notice that I tend to prefer neutral colors, darker colors, I like fall and autumn autumn type tones because I feel like that's what fits best with my skin. I try to dress very modestly as well and that is what makes me confident and that really did play a huge play into a huge increase in my self-esteem because I felt like my outfits my the way I was presenting to my myself to the world was reflective of who I was and also what I wanted to show I wanted people to see me as put together but also comfortable as someone who you know gives off a vibe that they can talk to this person this person's friendly but also modest this person holds very highly the the value of modesty they care about their faith they care about what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala thinks so that is how to address self-esteem let's move on to number two right so number two is depression can be caused by an an experience with a single event now a lot this is probably the most for people who haven't dealt with depression this probably is going to be the thing that does knock them into depression if they if i had to guess right if you're someone who doesn't have a proclivity towards depression i should say One single thing that happens in your life can knock you off your rocker. And there's not a single person in this world who isn't going to experience one of those things, whether it's a loss of a loved one, whether it's a diagnosis that becomes life-changing even for a short period of time, whether it is a job loss or uh, just some sort of big life stressor. When you are not in a place where you're able to cope with that experience or it comes so out of nowhere that you didn't even have time to prepare you can start to feel depressed the thing about this is one in a situation like this you really have to tune into remembering who you are what values do you hold what is it that is about you what is it about you that demonstrates resilience that you now have the opportunity to showcase in this challenge right and when we when we experience sudden events that like completely crash our our reality it's very easy to let go of the things that we already have inside of us and and the parts of us that saw us through saw us through different difficulties in our life and then when we do that there's a bit of a a bit of companionship with ourselves that we that we abandon and it actually makes it harder for us. So that's one is just remembering who you are, right? The part, the part of you that's seen you through the difficulties then is still with you now. Number two is lean into Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala during these times, right? This is Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is the one who changes destiny and he is the one who in all situations has the power to make things right. So lean into that relationship with them. Number three is there might be situations where you, you're mistaking your depression uh and it's actually grief that you're experiencing and grief is 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 kind of a tri phasal experience right it has a emotional part obviously the experience of grief is a deep sadness of a loss but then it also has a spiritual part because there's a distancing and, and a requirement to come to terms with qadr and allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's will for you 
And then there is also a neurological part. There's a neurophysiological part, the, a part of our brain that our brain is actually kind of freaking out because this thing that we were so used to that brought about a lot of stability that the brain had already interpreted as, okay, this is a constant in our environment. That thing is no longer there. And now your brain has to kind of reconcile that and actually change the patterns to cope with this new loss in this new environment and this new arrangement of life in front of you. And I think sometimes we forget to give a little bit of grace for that part, right? A loss a loss created our brains to be extremely resilient, but it still needs time to cope with the differences. And that doesn't mean that once you get to that point where you fully cope that you're not going to have episodes where things bring you back or memories are triggered or whatever it might be. But when you do get to those points in grief, you know that you've come over the big hurdle and now when those moments come, you you get to sit there with yourself. And I say you get to sit there with yourself because it is an honor because that grief that you're experiencing means that you experience something beautiful. And now that it's not there, it, it that's why it's so distressing to you. So remember who you are, lean into your relationship with Allah subhanahu wa Give yourself space to grieve. A lot of times once the grieving process is over, usually that's within, again, a month and a half for people. A one to two months is, I, I believe, the, the statistical number. Then, inshallah, hopefully the depression at that point has resolved. And if it doesn't, then there are people who are specialized in grief counseling who can be very helpful in that situation. Okay. Number three. And this is a type of depression I speak about very often, which is depression due to unresolved or chronic trauma. So, trauma. I am a trauma coach. So this is something I talk about a lot. Unresolved trauma. This is a lot to talk about. But if I had to give a breakdown, what is trauma? Trauma is both a physical experience and a physiological experience. It is Trauma is an event that is so overwhelming to our brains and bodies that our brain doesn't even have time to process it into long-term memory. So that our brain now is so terrified about protecting us from this thing, this event, this thing that happened and sees it as a threat to our well-being that it doesn't let us process it and it replaces it over and over and over again. And this might be to the full extent of like full-blown flashbacks, but also just our body enacting the same things that it did when that thing happened. So for example, if something happened and you, I'll give a common example, there are people that might have gotten into a car accident, may lost spontaneous to protect us from that. And after that found it to be very difficult to get into a car without getting shaky. That's because the event was traumatic to them. And so that now their brain is interpreting this thing, this act of getting to a car is associated with a detrimental uh, impact on our safety and our health. And so that that is the trauma. Now, when you deal with trauma that has not been resolved, and granted, most people, you know, when when they mo- most people when they go through a trauma, especially if it's a small, smaller trauma, their brain will eventually kind of figure out how to process it. But for a lot of people, they just don't know how, and that's not a moral fault. It's not a failure on your part. It is. This is a skill set that you learn to be able to process trauma. Is just like. It, it is something we learn and some of us were not taught that or in this modern world that we live in, there is a lot that actually strips us away from our, our body's natural ability to heal trauma, right? All the craziness that we see around us, the fact that we are constantly bombarded by electronics and stimuli and all of this, it actually depletes our ability to deal with trauma. So it's not fully your fault, but that doesn't mean that we have to ev- evade the opportunity to learn how to process trauma. So when it comes to processing chronic trauma, and if you're interesting, I actually interested, I actually did a full blown uh, podcast with the Mad Memluks, which I'll try to remember to link in the bio, where I went into extensive detail on this. I mean, that podcast was very long. It was like three hours long. So we talked a lot about this. So I'll link that for you. But processing cr- chronic trauma because trauma is a process of the nervous system, not processing what's going on. I said process. It is basically the nervous system not being able to process what had happened. You have to reverse engineer the nervous system and learn to show your nervous system, hey, this is how we experience safety. And now this memory of this traumatic thing can be brought up in a way that is safe and doesn't throw us into fight or flight and slowly be processed in that way. So this is something called nervous system regulation. 
And this is something also, uh, there's a there's a process called somatic processing, which is what I was talking about, reverse engineering the nervous system. With that being said, if you are a Muslim woman who is watching this, you are so tired of having to deal day to day with the effects of trauma in your life. I have a group coaching program for Muslim women. It is 10 weeks long. The link is in the bio if you are interested. I have a, it's kind of on a, a running basis. It's a cohort system. So it, every two months or so, um, the program launches. I only offer it for women at this time. So if you're interested, go ahead and look at it. All information is in the link and including the cost of the program. So that is dealing with trauma. Next. Next, and we are at number four, depression secondary to lack of purpose. This is a depression that sneaks up on a lot of people. And, you know, it's funny because this is a very common experience for a lot of people. But if you are someone who, who grew up in a culture also that is very family oriented, and that's beautiful. A lot of us have Islam in and of itself is a very family oriented religion. But we all some of us come from cultures where that's emphasized to a different degree. It can be very easy for people to live, have this experience. I'm sure you know someone, right? They ended up going into a career because of pressure from their, their family and wanting to make their parents happy, blah, blah, blah. And then finding that this career is actually so unfulfilling for them and depletes them completely and it leads to depression. Now, I always caveat this with, with saying that even the ability to think about things that you want to do and do them is actually a privilege in and of itself. Like there are people, there are so many people who don't have the privilege to be able to say, hey, I'm going to do this because it fulfills me because they need to be putting food on the table. And this is one thing that I really struggle with when it comes to, when it came to the self-improvement niche, which is why I created this channel for God conscious self-improvement is that there was almost like this blaming of people, hey, well, you need to do, do this to get your life together. And it's like, but also people when they're living in chaos and they're just trying to feed their families and they're just trying to survive they don't have the luxury of full-blown like self-improvement. So it has to look very different to them. So if you're someone who is dealing with depression from a lack of purpose, and this is one, again, it's very sneaky, but you usually can identify it because there's going to be a point in time where it's like prior to that, prior to starting that thing that you maybe that is, is depleting you of your purpose or you just feel empty you feel like your life is going nowhere. You feel like you don't, you, you're not contributing to the world in the way you want to. You might feel like you wake up every morning for, for example, if your career is the reason you're lacking purpose. This just tends to be a, the, one of the more common things. You wake up hating your job, right? If that's the case and you're dealing with that kind of depression, then a few different things that you can do, right? So first things first, Right. If you can straight up just disconnect from the thing that is giving you lack of purpose, if you have the resources to do that, a lot of a lot of people do. Then sit down with yourself, identify what the fears are, what is so scary, and build your kind of your safety net, and switch over to something that is more fulfilling. So I'll give you an example. Actually, I know a brother who was an engineer for a very long time, had a very good job, took very good uh, care of his family. He is a community member in my community, someone who we, we respect very highly and has just done so much Islamic work in our community. Eventually, he ended up getting laid off from his job. And this tends to happen, I noticed, with a lot of engineering company, a lot of companies that hire engineers. And instead of jumping from one job to another, he actually took that as an opportunity to build his own coaching company. And so that was a shift in his sense of purpose, right? And he, he I'm sure knowing him and kind of knowing the way he operates, I'm sure he made it a point to build up a good safety net. He actually moved out of the country. So that also probably decreased his cost of living, allows his family to have different opportunities than that, what they would have had in the United States and then move forward. So if you have the resources, that is something you can think about. And the biggest thing is just what are the fears, right? And if you can speak to a counselor about this, if you can speak to a good friend or someone who could advise you and walk through it, that will be, that might be very helpful. The other thing, if you're dealing with a lack of purpose, but maybe it's not necessarily because of your job, 
Think about ways that you can serve. A lot of times the lack of purpose that we have is because we might not have realized that we were being exceptionally selfish in the way that we were living our lives. And there's something very powerful about serving other people, serving humanity, right? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala put us on this earth as Khalifa to love, right? The ones that are supposed to be kind of the masters of, of the world. And part of that is service to the world. And when we live in a, in a way that we don't offer our gifts to the world, it can leave us feeling very disconnected. Right, because our, our, our purpose, obviously, first and foremost, is to worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. But then after that, outside, you know, after that, we serve, serve our families. There's an entire community of people that are in need. So find something that you can volunteer for. And there are so many opportunities. If you need, want to find an organization, you want to work with your masjid. If you're in university or college and you want to work with your MSA, maybe you want to freelance or do some free work based on your skill set for a, a cause that you think is so beautiful and deserving. Um, maybe you uh, run a halaqa or you uh, make it a point if there's some a neighbor who needs help with something you offer help figure out what it is that really drives you and makes you excited and serve in that way the other thing is educate yourself and when I say educate yourself I mean build your skill set when we lack purpose sometimes it's just a, a, a matter of like we have felt so unmotivated for so long just diversifying our skill set and being like, hey, I'm actually building myself can really help build a sense of purpose. And then sometimes from there, you can identify what you want to contribute to, what this big thing in your life that you want to contribute to. And it also doesn't have to be one big thing. There's often a narrative of like, I need to have one life's purpose. No, you can have many life's, life's purposes, life purposes. There can be a lot of things that you enjoy doing and you kind of put like 20% here and 30% there right? It doesn't have to be this big thing, but only you can figure that out for yourself. Now, then the last point that I'll say is God conscious self-improvement is a huge way to build your Allah and Sadaq Muhammad, um, your sense of purpose. And you following, actually you being on this, if you're not subscribed to the channel, please subscribe. We're building an awesome community and it's been really cool. Um, and I anticipate that this, ch this channel is going to grow a lot I plan to stay dedicated to it, inshallah. But God conscious self improvement is basically self improvement that is built with that it, uh, that happens within a moral framework, right? So it's guided by your relationship with Allah Subhanahu Wa Taala. It's guided by the be belief that you are going to be doing things that are pleasing to Allah, and it could be within so many realms of your life: your family, right, your your job and your finances, your house, your relationship with your spouse if you're married, your re relationship with your kids, your uh, hobbies. All of that. But God self, God conscious self-improvement is always about how do I make things better and how do I build myself to the version of the ihsan version of myself, the excellent version of myself. That is God conscious self-improvement. There's something so purposeful about that because you see where you are right now and then you are envisioning the version of you in the in that you want to be and then you're making steps towards that and like that is so excited the easiest thing that i can think of to compare to is working out i'm someone who does strength building weightlifting and i absolutely love it and one of the most exciting parts is when i can go up on a weight or i can increase the rep sets or i can add in another set right there's something very physical that i can see as a metric of my progress and that makes me more motivated to do it and obviously the long-term health effects are also awesome now I think I am going to stop this video here. And in the next video, I am going to go through number five, six, and seven. If you are someone, you guys, who is interested in this 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 whole realm of God conscious self-improvement, if you are interested in healing trauma, and that's just a topic that really, really spikes your your curiosity, I have two free ebooks that you can get by signing up to my newsletter. The link is always below. It's always in my uh, description. You just put your name in your email. It's sent to you immediately. And then people who are in my newsletter are like, that is my exclusive community, right? And it's been growing, alhamdulillah, very quickly. But that is my exclusive community, meaning you guys are the ones who get the first offers on things. You guys are the one who get the first access on so many things. It goes to you first. So if that is something that you're interested in, join the newsletter. Otherwise, please like this video, subscribe. And if you would like to leave a comment. It really helps with the algorithm. Thank you guys so much and I'll see you in the next. Assalamu alaikum.